Good morning. Welcome to the Worship of Almighty God here at Worship Community Presbyterian Church. My name is Tyler. I'm the pastor here, and it is a wonderful day to worship God together. Thank you so much for being here. Let's worship God. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fail Never enough And you came along And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better than you I'm not afraid to show you my weakness my failures and flaws Lord you've seen them all you still call me friend Cause the God of the mountain Is the God of the valley There's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me again Oh, there's nothing Better than you There's nothing Better than you, Lord There's nothing Nothing is better than you. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can Oh, there's nothing better than you There's nothing better than you Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you One of the many joys that we have in coming together each and every week in this virtual space is being able to greet one another with the love of this, with the love of Christ. We can do that even though we're separated uh, by space and time, probably, uh, because we have the technology. We have this ability to communicate with one another. Uh, you can do this through worship, but you can also do this with your friends. So uh, use that phone that you have. Use that computer that you have. Text someone, call someone, reach out. Let them know how much you care about them, how glad you are that they're part of your life and that you thank God for them. So let's take a moment, let's uh, be a community, even in our separated uh, spaces that we're in, and let's greet one another with the love of Christ. morning, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, in Christ you taught us to pray and promise that we would receive all that we ask in his name. Hear now our prayers for the church universal, for this congregation, its mission and ministry, for the healing of the earth, for peace and justice in the world, for nations and leaders, for our local community, for the poor and oppressed, for the bereaved and lonely, for all who need healing. Guide us, O God, by your Holy Spirit, that all of our prayers and all of our lives may serve your will and show your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. This is the transfiguration story from Luke's Gospel, from Mark's Gospel. Uh, Listen to the word of the Lord from Mark, chapter 9. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and brought them to the top of a very high mountain where they were all alone. He was transformed in front of them, and his clothes were amazingly bright, brighter than if if they had been bleached white. Elijah and Moses appeared and were talking with Jesus. Peter reacted to all of this by saying to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good that we're here. Let's make three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't know how to respond, for the three of them were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice spoke from the cloud, This is my son, whom I dearly love. Listen to him. Suddenly, looking all around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them not to tell anyone what they had seen until after the human one had been risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this story uh, is right in that interesting, this is a transition point in the church calendar from Epiphany, which is the season after Christmas, uh, which is, it starts with, uh, on Epiphany, when we talk about the wise men and how they, uh, the world basically started to recognize that God is here. Uh, and then this transition into Lent, which is the season as we prepare for Easter and what that means. And so transfiguration always happens at this time. It always comes, falls in the church calendar here. Uh, transfiguration is a story that happens in the three synoptic gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, there's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Uh, the three that are called the Synoptic Gospels all share a source. Like Mark is pretty much almost entirely like verbatim. 80% of Mark is in both Matthew and Luke. Uh, none of any of the same stuff is shared by John. John will tell some of the same stories, but in very different ways. And so it's all the same story of Jesus, but from very, very different flavors. Um, but the transfiguration happens in the synoptics, not in John. And so we get Mark's version of it. So every year at this time, we get one of the versions of it. Uh, and, and this year we get Mark's version. Uh, Mark is the most immediate of all the gospels because he was certainly the first read. And it doesn't mean that he is like hasty. It just means that it's now it's uh, everything is happening immediately. There's, there's an immediacy to it. There's a present tense to what's happening in Mark, which is kind of interesting and fun. Uh, and so this happens, uh, we, we've been in chapter one uh, up through the beginning of the year since we started Mark. Um, and then we suddenly jump to chapter nine, which is towards the end of the story. There's Again, Mark goes real quick. And so a lot happens between chapter one and chapter nine. And we do this just because we have to match the church calendar leading into Easter. We're going to go back to chapter one next week when we go to the temptation narrative. It's all kind of confusing. Uh, so anyway, transfiguration. The transfiguration is one of those things that we both completely were like, oh yeah, we get it. He was transformed. And we probably don't understand it very well. Uh, most of us probably see everybody else understanding it and just think, yeah, I understand what that means. He got shiny. That's really important that Jesus got shiny. Uh, so there's some mystery in this. Uh, some of it makes sense. It's not that complicated. He just glow- glowed really bright. But why uh, is a great answer or a great question. So there is truly some mystery in this. There's truly stuff that we don't understand, stuff that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to us. And that's okay. We'll talk a little bit about that. So Jesus, uh, right before this, has um, uh, basically just told his disciples the whole story of the passion. That he's going to be arrested. He's going to be crucified. He's going to die. He's going to be risen from the dead uh and all of this has to happen and they're all like yeah it sounds great what are you talking about they don't understand it they don't get that jesus is talking about himself uh they're kind of clueless as to what he's actually means even though they've been with him for a while uh and so he takes peter james and john and he goes up on this mountain uh historically mount carmel one of the other gospels says mount carmel uh and goes up and when he's there he's transformed 
Now, what is he transformed into? It doesn't really say. Other than it just, he's really bright. He's transformed and suddenly he he glows and he glows brighter than anything you can think of. And this is, the light is emanating from him. He's not reflecting stuff. He's the sun, not the moon, if you get that. The, the sun creates light. The moon reflects light. Uh, and that's a kind of important distinction. And so as he starts to glow, uh, Moses shows up and Elijah shows up. Uh, Moses and Elijah, key figures from the Old Testament, uh, and that's important as well. And so Moses represents the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. Torah just means law. Historically, uh, Moses is credited as being the author of that, but Moses is the personification of the Torah, which is, again, a major kind of cornerstone of the Hebrew scriptures. And then, um, Elijah represents the prophets. So the the Torah is you is primarily the the or the the sorry the Hebrew scriptures the Tanakh is what it's called is primarily the the Torah the Nevi'im which is uh, the prophets and the Ketuvim which is writings um, and that makes up the Hebrew scriptures the Old Testament and so these two really personify that. Moses representing the law of God and Elijah representing the prophets of God or the voice of God. Uh, and so in this, they're talking to Jesus and we don't hear what they're talking about. We, it's very interesting. I always kind of wonder what they're talking about, but it represents everything that we've known about God through the scriptures, through the oral narratives that are in past that are represented in these two, the law, the structure that God gives us and the way in which God speaks truth, even into uh, the world kind of around us. So as this is happening, um, Peter, who is afraid, just says, uh, I know what we should do. Let's build some shrines for everybody. Uh, and Peter is great. Peter is, it's always so good to have Peter in the stories, mainly because Peter always screws up. Uh, and I, I say that very lovingly. Peter is great and is really great for us because the bar is set very low. <laughs> for us. Um, Peter has such enthusiasm and wants to do the right thing. And he often does it without thinking. And he, or when he thinks he's doing the right thing, it's really the wrong thing. Um, I've characterized him before, and I think that this is still pretty accurate. He's God's golden retriever. Uh, he is, a golden retriever is just wonderful and so faithful, and they're kind of smart for dogs, but that's still not that smart. And they just are kind of very willing to please you, very excited. Golden retrievers are great. They uh, do, they bring such joy into every room and kind of, they smell. <laughs> Um, but they're just really exuberant and want to do stuff all the time. And uh, that's how Peter is. He's just so excited. And so often he is just uh, chasing after a ball that's not there or getting distracted and not paying attention to what's going on. Uh, and here it shows that he is scared. And this is a scary thing that happens. This is a, a pretty significant event that his friend just starts to glow. They still don't have any idea what's going on. They didn't get the story at all. Uh, and they're kind of in the presence of something big and they re they recognize, I don't know how they recognize that it was Moses and Elijah, but they do. And they know what, that that means something significant. And so Peter's suggestion is we should try to make meaning out of this. We should try to understand this in a way that memorializes the situation. Let's build a shrine. Let's build a monument. Let's build a church. Let's put a building here so that we'll always know that this thing happened here. And then God interrupts Peter and tells him to be quiet. <laughs> uh, I love this because uh, Peter's just kind of going like, yeah, we could do this and this and this. And then God just, just stops and says, Peter, stop. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And that stops all the talk. And I do love that it also says that Peter was only saying that because he was, he was afraid. Uh, we often, when we're, when we don't understand things that makes us afraid. And so we try to control it. We try to reframe it in, in kind of language that we can control language that we understand. He didn't know what was going on. He was terrified by this thing. And the, what he could think of is when terrifying things happen, you should mark them by creating a shrine, creating a monument, creating some kind of building to, to honor the space that we don't understand. And the best we can understand it is just say, something happened here. We don't really know what it was, but something happened here. So let's build a thing. 
And God is basically saying, no, calm down. Listen, don't act yet. Listen. We focus so much energy and a lot of the early Mark and um, scripture focuses on following uh, and following is really important and we, we need to follow Jesus. But what we often turn that into is following Jesus is following uh, into glory that we want worship. We want to radiate. We want to be shiny. We want people to look at us and go, oh my goodness, it's so amazing. God is good. And just be astounded by our uh, beneficence that, <laughs> that God has bestowed upon us and that we can bestow upon others. That through our victory, through our uh, hard work, God will be glorified. So we really want, we see Jesus glowing and we think, I want to glow too. Let me be the glowy Jesus. And Peter, or God says to Peter, stop. Listen. Listening to Jesus is important. We don't often really uh, characterize it uh, uh, with such importance. Listening is hard. Listening is, is, is understanding. Um, we, we, we often say that we need to be listener, or, uh, followers of Christ, but we rarely say that we need to be listeners of Christ. Part of the thing about listening, too, is that it implies that God is still speaking, that we need to listen for what is still being said, not just study, not just memorize, but listen. That the, the, the predictions about the crucifixion were already there. We're already there in scripture. We're already understood that the Messiah was not a new concept, but the way in which Jesus was enacting this, the Messiah that Jesus was, was brand new. We need to listen. Now, sometimes when we listen, it's, it's important to, to kind of calm down. We got to turn off the other things. We, our, our phones, if, uh, a lot of our phones have these functions on them that we could put do not disturb on our phone. We can put sleep mode or work mode on our phone and it silences a lot of the notifications and things that come in. It makes our phone a lot dumber. So it starts just being a phone <laughs> instead of this computer that we carry around with us that tells us everything all the time. Sometimes when we need to listen, we turn off the TV, we may put on soothing music, we may turn off all the music, we may um, go to a private place, we may go outside, but we calm things down. Lent is a season not to glorify ourselves through our piety or our uh, being martyrs through what we gave up or, or trying to let other people see how glowy we are, how much God emanates from us. But instead, it's a time to listen. It's a time to, to hear that God is still speaking. We can't do the things that we need to do if we don't know what it is that we're supposed to do. We are Peter. Peter, again, is such a great example. So many times we think, oh, I don't really understand what this is, but I think it's probably this, so I'll do that. And so we build a building, we build a shrine, we build a monument. We start to do before we even understand. Jesus is, is still trying to speak. Jesus is speaking into the world today that we are confronted with uh, not black or white, but a, a wide spectrum of reality and the, the simplicity is that God loves everyone. But the difficult thing is, how can God love them when they act like that? How can God love them when they are so different than me? And who is right? Me or them? And God wants us to love. God is saying, calm down. Just listen. We see this in other Bible stories too. We see this in, in Saul who becomes Paul. Uh, Saul thought he was following God, thought he was doing the right thing, thought that these people who were speaking of this, this teacher who had died and was risen again, were, were speaking things on behalf of God that were wrong. 
And so he thought the best thing that he could do, that the thing that God wanted him to do was to defend the faith, to the faith, to, uh, to tell people how wrong they were and to stop them by all, by all means from spreading these lies about God. And in the midst of that, as he's on his way to Damascus to persecute more Christians, uh, to stop these heretics from corrupting people's minds by saying this uh, mistruth about God, that God loves more than just this small group of people, but that God loves everyone and that God has come in human form. What a blasphemous thing to say. On the road to Damascus, he is blinded by the light and he is confronted by Jesus who says, stop, listen to me. And Saul does, he becomes Paul and he constantly is wrestling with this, this idea of doing something and then stopping and listening. And you can see throughout the writings that he constantly is having to say to himself, like, I need to calm down and listen because God's saying something that's different than what I thought. I was fixed in my understanding but God is still teaching me. We see this in, in other stories, like the feeding of the 5,000, where Jesus says to the disciples, hey, uh, can you feed these people? Let's feed these people. Like they've been there all day. They've been following along and, and Jesus has been preaching and the disciples say, well, uh, why don't we let these people go eat? And Jesus said, you can feed them. And there's the disciples like, we really can't. There's 5,000 people. There's 12 of us, Jesus. We didn't bring enough food for 5,000 people. Let's just let them leave. And Jesus said, well, what do you have? I'm like, not enough. <laughs> and then this young boy comes up to them and says, well, I got this. I got five loaves or five fish and two loaves, five loaves and two fish. I got some, some food. <laughs> and uh, the disciples say, yeah, that's not enough. And Jesus says, that sounds fine. We're very willing to tell ourselves, to tell others that what they have is not good enough in the name of trying to help them. But instead, we need to be listening to God, who's constantly saying, that's pretty good. We can use that. When we listen to God, we, we stop letting ourselves be the ones who are trying to tell Jesus what we should do, like Peter does. We stop trying to understand and to categorize the thing while it's happening, but we just let it happen. The Bible is really helpful for us, but the Bible is not the point. The Bible is like a cookbook. You can memorize a cookbook, but it doesn't mean anything if you don't know how to cook. The cookbook doesn't make you a good cook. You have to put it into practice. And any cookbook doesn't yield immediate good results. You still have to get better at it. You have to listen uh, to what's happening in, in the cooking. And you probably need somebody to help you. And you need to listen to them. There's so many times I've uh, been given directions by someone and I thought I knew it. And I said, ah, I'll just follow you. I'm not listening to what you're saying. And then we would, be, I would be following them and we'd get to a traffic light and they would dry, they would make it through the yellow light and I'd have to stop at a red light and they were gone. And I had no idea where they were going because I didn't listen. I just wanted to follow. We want to get past the point of listening. We want to get past the point of understanding and just jump to the action. Just tell me what to do. I don't want to, don't tell me what the rules are. Let's just start playing. We're so impatient because we think that listening is a waste of time when we could be doing. God is telling us, listen to Jesus. We've got 40 days coming up. 40 days that, like I said, are not about proving how holy we are, but instead proving giving us the chance to, to listen, to really take the time to, to study, take the time to be open to what it is that God is saying to us. And, and not just through the Bible, but through the world to know that God is still speaking and speaking in places that we don't expect it. That's why we're doing a book study. We're doing 
uh, a, we're, we're going to have a film club starting back up and it's not going to be religious films. It's going to be films that are the ones that we would watch in general. We have the podcasts and opportunities to talk about culture, to talk about the world that we live in, in ways in which God is present in the things that we encounter every single day, not just the things that not just the shrines and the monuments that we've already built telling us this is what's happening but instead truly speaking in places that we don't expect. Lent is bookended by mountains. We have the one mountain, Mount Carmel, where the transfiguration happens. And then 47 days later, we've got Golgotha, the mountain where Jesus is crucified. On one mountain, he is transfigured and and becomes the majesty of God. On one mountain, he is the ultimate uh, demonstration of God's love, a love that is so big for all people and so true that he's willing to die to save others. We can look towards these two mountains and so desperately we wanna be this one we want to be the one that brings us glory, that brings God glory, but makes us shine, makes us look magic, majestic, makes us look great. But Jesus is telling us that we need to be ready for this mountain, not to be martyred, but to love, not to be persecuted, not to be attacked, but to love. What does it look like to love? It looks like this, to this degree, that you're willing to give all you have to save others. As we enter into this journey through these 40 days, let us be people who are not trying to glorify ourselves to become so shiny that people are impressed by our actions, but let us be people who are willing to love so much that we give everything for it, for all people. Let us spend this time listening to the world around us to try to figure out what it, how that could be love why that Friday can be called good. We have 40 days. It's time enough to listen. And then after that, we've got 40 more days. And after that, we got 40 more days. We don't ever stop listening because God is still speaking. Let us follow Christ, but even more, let us listen to Christ because we don't know where we're going until we hear where God is leading us. God wants us to love everybody, but we can't love our neighbor if we don't know who our neighbor is. We can't love our enemy if we don't know that they are human. We can't love ourselves if we don't know the value that God has for us and the love that God has for us. Let us listen to a God who is love. Let us listen to a God who is a mystery, who does things that we don't fully understand that can be terrifying, but a God who is good and a God who is still speaking, even now. Amen. See?
that you are provider, you are protector, you are the one I love, I believe you are the way, the truth, the life, I believe you are the way, the truth. It's a new horizon and I'm set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new all my fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long when I'm here with you it's a new horizon and I'm set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new All my fears and doubts They can all come to Because they can't stay long When I believe you are The way The truth The life I believe you are the way, the truth, the life, I believe you are. So now it's time for us to go. It's time for us to leave this place to go back into our regularly scheduled lives and do our regularly scheduled things and to be surprised by the things that are not regularly scheduled but still happen to us. Let us go with ears that would hear. Let us go ready to listen to God and to follow God into places that we wouldn't expect. Let us not tell God where we should be, but let us follow God and listen to God to see the ways in which God is being revealed through people that we wouldn't expect, through places that we wouldn't expect, and things that we wouldn't expect. So let's go. And as we go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Have a fantastic week. Enjoy all of the things that are happening this uh, this evening and this week. Enjoy the Super Bowl. Enjoy the Usher halftime show. Enjoy either being very excited or very annoyed or very uh, bothered or unaffected by the Taylor Swift. Uh, but enjoy all the things. Know that we have our Ash Wednesday services coming up this Wednesday. It is a joint service between Highland Presbyterian, North Mount Presbyterian, and us. We mix it all up and it's at a different church each year and this year it's going to be at Northmont Presbyterian uh starts at 6 p.m on Wednesday and there's a, a meal and then worship worship starts at seven if you don't show up right at six you can still have the meal uh it's going to be soup and it's going to be great we'd love to have you there so join us this Wednesday the 14th of February uh for Ash Wednesday service at Northmont Presbyterian Church uh if you can if not we'll see you next week have a fantastic week do good things see you later